Welcome to the WorkJoy Jam podcast. I'm your host, Beth Stallwood. And in this episode, I'm joined by the wonderful Dr. Rena Bajaj. And Rena is a counselling psychologist um, with loads of experience across many, many different forms of helping people with what's going on in their minds. And what I particularly love about this conversation with Rena is how practical some of her suggestions are the things about how we understand what's going on in our heads, how we can understand the red flags and the green flags and be able to have a more balanced perspective of some of the things that happen where maybe we're triggered, where we have some fear responses, where we don't know what to do, where we're trying to step out of our comfort zone. So for me, the practical application, some really good tips are what I loved about this conversation and I hope you love it too. Welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I am delighted today to be joined by Dr. Rena Bajaj, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But rather than me introduce Rena, can I get you to tell our audience who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your story about how you got to where you are today? Hi, Beth. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here and to chat to you. Um, so I'm a counselling psychologist by background. Um, so At the moment, I run my own practice where I see clients for one-to-one sessions, couples therapy, but I also deliver training to corporates and then I do lots of other interesting things like write books and um, you know uh, contribute to media articles but my journey has been really interesting and it probably links in with my philosophy to life really Um, but I've sort of chopped and changed and um, I've worked within uh, community settings so grassroots organizations working a lot with BME communities those affected by substance misuse and domestic abuse Um, then I moved into working within the NHS and was working with vulnerable young people Um, and then I moved into sort of the employment side of things so working within the employment uh, employee assistance kind of welfare to Mm. work side of things Um, one of my most interesting jobs though is probably a millionaire matchmaker um, which sounds (laughs) a little bit out there (laughs) Um, but that was basically uh, working with kind of ultra high net worth people, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but then also helping them to think about their approach to life, their values. Um, so it wasn't just matching people on the basis of love, but also helping them to think about some of the limiting beliefs that sometimes come up when you're on the mm. journey. And then I took a completely different turn and went down the forensic route. So working within uh, a magistrate's court and probation, um, and then went back into working with children. So I've kind of taken all of that information and all of that experience and now put it into my private practice. So what I found is that everyone has their pain point, um, yeah. everyone has their vulnerability, um, everyone has their triggers. So at the moment, I'm really passionate about helping people to align with their authentic selves and challenge yeah. some of the stuff that they've learnt. So to kind of unlearn that and then relearn it to make it work for them. So it's been a bit of an interesting career path, I would say. It's amazingly interesting. And it's one thing I'm just really reflecting on here is how many people you have been involved with from all different you know, stages of life and all different backgrounds and different um, situations that people find themselves in, different environments, different challenges. Mm-hmm. And it, I'm really fascinated about this because, you know, working with people who have challenges of substance abuse or working with people who've been in domestic violence and then working with millionaires and understanding that actually humans, mm. we all have the same challenges, right? <laughs> Whether we've got a really challenging situation going on. And I think it's really easy for us to assume I, I'm not a millionaire, um, that millionaires have life easy. But their same struggles go on internally with our minds, right? Definitely. And I think sometimes with people who are entrepreneurs or who are kind of perfectionists, there's an internal battle that goes on in their head. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's when they reach a point where they've achieved the goals they set out to achieve, where they realise that they can't keep running from themselves. Um, and I think this is like a common theme across across humans really Mm. there comes a certain point where you realize that these are the things that work for me 
these are the things that I've tried to run away from. And actually, this is what I really need to address if I want to live a full life. Um, And I think sometimes with success, however we define that, there can sometimes be lots of shame associated with either not feeling happy or not feeling grateful all of the time or not being positive all of the time. Um, and, And sometimes people can go inwards because of that and feel like they don't have a right to feel emotions. Yeah, but we're all human and we all have them wherever we are at. And that kind of, I love this thing about like running away from yourself. And actually, when you think about some of the things that we do to not deal with the stuff that we need to deal with um, in life, it can be really challenging for us to work through some of those things. Maybe we'll come back to that in a little bit because I'd love Mm -hmm. to get some thoughts and advice from you. But one thing you said earlier when you were doing your introduction really piqued my interest. And now my curiosity is like, I need to know the answer to this question Mm -hmm. because you said about your philosophy to life. And then you talked to us about this wonderful, really varied career that you have had working with so many different people. And I'm like, I need to know what that is. I need to know it. (laughs) So one of my main philosophies to life is Um, it's really important to keep pushing outside of your comfort zone and on a personal and professional level I really take that seriously because I believe if I'm not willing to take the risks and to challenge myself how can I really encourage other people to do that and how Mm. can I be alongside them in their journey so for me it's about walking the talk really which is why you know it's quite easy to stay comfortable in a predictable situation. Uh, But one of the biggest kind of emotional risks and one of the the risks that kind of brought up lots of my own self-doubt was moving into private practice full time. Um, You know, so, but, you know, I really do believe that sometimes you have to take the risk because you'll discover things about yourself and you'll Mm. realise that there's lots of internal beliefs about what you think you can and can't do. And lots of the things you think you can't do are not really true. Yeah, you just don't know how to do them yet. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and you don't maybe, you discover the tools to discover different parts of yourself. Mm. And that's the interesting thing. So, you know, whether I am working as a psychologist or not, I think that will always be my philosophy to kind of keep going, to, to live life in a state of adventure. And sometimes the not knowing is okay, because not knowing doesn't always mean that it's unsafe. Uh, sometimes it can be exciting to not know yeah it's like the possibilities and the who knows and the excitement of something that might be a surprise coming to you yeah um there are so many things I want to talk about here so I'm going to kick off and talk about some of them if that's okay and I the the idea of this pushing yourself out your comfort zone is one I fully support because growth doesn't happen in your comfort zone And actually, I find that the more we stick in our comfort zones and the more people I work with stick in their comfort zones, the more frustrated we actually get with ourselves. Mm. But it gets harder and harder to do the things that push ourselves out of our comfort zone because we've created kind of a nice, safe feeling. But the safety can become frustration. It can become annoyance. It can become that feeling of just being stuck. Mm. And you know, it doesn't always have to be as big, does it? As I'm going to go into private practice or I'm going to go and set up my own business or I'm going to go and do, you know, yeah. jump out of a helicopter. Yeah. Pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone can be really small stuff that we do. Yeah, I agree. It might be kind of going to a new gym class. It might be taking, uh, going to learn a new language. It might be talking to someone in a coffee shop. It might even be kind of trying a new food or going on holiday. So it doesn't have to be kind of a massive thing. But what it does do is it's anything I think that connects you to yourself um, and encourages you to reflect in life. Because although we can stay in our comfort zone and we think it's safe. I think a lot of the time that's a false sense of security. What it is is predictable. Um, But what we essentially end up doing then is living in survival rather than thriving, which we can do for a little while. But then, as you mentioned there, Beth, your resentment can build up, the anger can build up, the frustration can build up uh, because there's less meaning and less purpose in life. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that thriving sense, that being able to work through the challenge of whatever it is that you're stepping into. And, you know, I do think stepping out of your comfort zone often has that feeling of being slightly icky and slightly sticky and a bit scary. And in that process, though, that's the process where you learn the stuff that helps you to be the thing that you want to be. Mm -hmm. And so often I, I speak to people who say, I'm just waiting for the confidence to be able to go and do that thing I really, really want to do. Mm -hmm. And my challenge back to them, and I'd be interested in hearing about this from a psychological, like 
the, the, how the brain works with this. But my my advice to them is always the confidence is gained in the doing, in the action, not in the waiting for the confidence to come to do the thing. Yeah. If we wait for the confidence, that's just procrastination. That's just avoidance. Yeah. Um, so what we really want to be working on is not just the action and the, the behavior, but also the thoughts and feelings associated with it. Because procrastination, avoidance, um, although we might judge that, it's just a way to stay safe. So what we really want to start to understand is why am I thinking in this way? Uh, what mm. is the feeling that I'm trying to sort of control through avoidance? And then we want to start to lean into some of those feelings and lean into some of those thoughts to really check, like, are they 100% true? Um, and if they are factual, then you can do something about them and you can create a plan. But most of the time, some of our, our fears our thoughts are kind of, um, yeah, they're not really true. They're either a fear or they're an opinion or they're an expectation. Um, and so we can kind of limit ourselves in that way. Um, and I think you can stagger the risk that you take. So kind of start with things that feel less emotionally risky and then work your way up to your bigger goals. Mm. But there's a reason why on some level you want to change things. And that's probably because you want to be feeling and thinking in a different way. And you can start to incorporate bits of that into your day to day life in the now as you work towards your bigger goals. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting, isn't it? It's about the fact that procrastination is, is a way of avoiding the thing that you need to do. And it's a way of not having those feelings that you don't want to step into. Yeah. And so often that whole, why am I thinking in this way? I know for certain, I would spend ages thinking about that particular question and very little time because I don't like it. Mm. <laughs> what is the feeling I'm trying to you know, run away from or the feeling I want to have, but I don't have yet. Yeah. So I think, and I, I think there, and I wonder if a lot of people do this, we get stuck in our heads with the thinking and totally ignore the fact that this is actually an emotional thing that we need to deal with. And we need to work through the feeling to be able to do what we need to do. Yeah. And our thoughts are so powerful. You know, we have between 70,000 and a hundred thousand thoughts a day. Most of them are also unconscious. So they're probably similar thoughts that we had today that we had yesterday and the day before and the day before. So even if you can't sit with the feeling, just tune into the thought, even just to check if it's true or not, you can start there, you mm. know, and then you can start to get a picture of whether your mindset is skewed more towards negative thinking or fear-based thinking rather than a more balanced way of thinking and yeah. I, I you know I'm not kind of being patronizing here and saying to people just flip a negative to a positive <laughs> yeah that's, no don't that's always what work like that to do um but you know I think at least if you evaluate it and you zoom out from your thoughts so you just start to balance the thought out so yeah you know, if I'm making a change it might be scary but I'm doing the best that I can and that might be a balanced thought or it feels really scary but I don't have to do everything right now that might be another yeah. balance thought. Not, you know, don't be so silly. It's it's fine. I'm going to be fine. You know, that might not be as helpful. So you just want to start to balance your thought. And you can be the most positive person in life, but also your thoughts might be skewed more towards um, fear-based thinking. Yeah. It's really interesting you talk about this whole, you know, I'm doing the best I can. And, like, it's, it's not saying, it's not doing the whole, I'll just put, like, a smiley face on it and say, everything's fine because that isn't actually helpful is it it's saying do you know what I do feel a bit scared about this or this situation makes me feel really uncomfortable or what's going on at work right now I don't know how to deal with it mm. but I'm gonna do something about it I'm doing the best I can maybe it's also a I'm gonna go and get some people to help me with this because I don't have to do it alone mm. there are so many things that we could do that are what would I call them you probably have some proper psychological term for it but I'd call them like small action-based progress steps is what yeah. I would call them I suppose what you're developing is probably more adaptive coping mechanisms there you go I knew you'd have something proper to call it <laughs> and something kind of more more real right um and I think sometimes we have to adapt our coping mechanisms like if we look uh, if we look at the whole COVID situation, for example, you know, maybe we had coping, coping mechanisms before that and then we couldn't do the things that we normally did and mm -hmm. then we had to adapt. So um, we, I think we need to constantly be checking in with ourselves because we are fluid and we are constantly changing. And it might be we change due to situations around us or a specific incident, for example, at work, or it might be that we're just internally changing as we discover who we are. Um, so that kind of 
chance to reflect is really important. Yeah, and I think as well, I, I talk about this quite a lot in the work joy side of things, is that the gloomy moments, the stuff that feels uncomfortable, maybe that fear-based thinking, whatever it is, the negativity stuff, always... I mean, obviously there are examples where there is genuine fear and there are reasons to be scared. But for quite a lot of the stuff I think that happens in the working context, let's take it at work, quite a lot of that stuff, we end up blowing out of proportion. So the negative stuff has a greater impact on us, Mm -hmm. even if it is smaller in reality than the kind of positive things that happened in a day. So if you have, I don't know if you ever do this, but if you had one tough conversation with somebody during the day, you might ruminate on that for the rest of the day mm. and ignore the fact that you've had seven amazing conversations with brilliant people because the, the the negative stuff just really sticks in our minds. Yeah, we start to filter out the positive. So that's a little bit of black and white thinking. It's either mm. this or that. But also when we're in our thoughts, it's very easy to start catastrophizing and go to like yeah. the worst case scenario but if you find yourself doing that even if you're in the worst case scenario what what could you do there what's in your control and a lot of the time that might be your attitude it might be your behavior it might be seeking support um, it might be taking time out to ground yourself there will still be things that are in your control in terms of how you respond um, and and that's why the zooming out and the checking in with your thoughts is is quite important because um, one client once described it to me it's a bit like a soup in your head that you can then get stuck <laughs> into which I've yeah. got a really good analogy so you want to just start sorting it out and one of the things that you said there Beth I think is really important as a as a technique is to start to balance out some of the challenges with some of the positives or some of the strengths that you have in order to be able to manage those uh, those challenges. So when we are in an anxious state or we're stressed or we're in that fight or flight or we're on edge, the way that our brain's programmed is we're we're programmed to look for all the red flags and all the dangers. And, you know, at that point in time, our brain can't tell the difference between an emotional threat and a real threat or a perceived threat or a physical danger because our brain's not that sophisticated to some extent. So, you know, where you're looking out for all the red flags, you might be more sensitive to things. So just that kind of um, activity of balancing out with some of the positive things or some of the good things or things that went well or something that you've learned that day so building in some reflection helps you to move out of that reactive state Um, and that will just help to calm your body down uh, help you to have more objectivity and to be more present in the moment yeah and I, I think that's so important isn't it that bit around being able to calm that sense down and Mm. when we get that feeling on the inside that makes us feel like sometimes I don't know sometimes physically sick it kind Mm. of gets to that uh, point of you know really not liking that situation Mm. being able to know even just knowing that something has red flagged in your mind kind of blaming it going do you know what I've totally red flagged that my body and is reacting in a way that is out of proportion and even just knowing that I think can help yeah. but being able to do that quickly <laughs> in reaction when your body's reacting like that is not to catastrophize to kind of go oh there's some red flags here there's clearly some triggers that have wound me up made me upset got yeah. me emotional got me scared has done a fear response if I can just flag it as there's a red flag then I can sensibly go okay what do we do what yeah. are our what did you call them? Adaptive coping mechanisms. I love yeah. that. Um, what are those things that I have? Do I need to go and have a conversation with somebody so they can give me a reality check? Do I need to just go and take 10 minutes and go for a walk around the block and calm my nervous system down? Yeah. There are, must be loads of things that we can do in that moment if we can recognize what it is to help go, okay, let's get some reality back in this situation. Yeah. The first thing maybe is to like pay attention to your body. So, Mm. you know, um, there's a traffic light tool where I think it's quite useful to reflect on maybe at a time where you're calmer, like if you are in your kind of green functioning, which is an optimal functioning, how will you be thinking, feeling, what would you be doing? And that also includes how will your body be feeling? How do you then know if you're going into amber or red and what will help to bring you back down to either amber or to green? Um, And if you can kind of just think that through, then particularly if like a workspace is triggering or there's a a family member that's triggering or you're going into a situation which might amp up um, that stress response, then you've already got a bit of a plan. 
you are more in control. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, just having a think about, you know, uh, what could I use? What's in my toolkit that I can use, which doesn't necessarily need to take lots of time because I think sometimes the misconception is that grounding techniques or relaxation techniques take a long time or you need an hour or you need to kind of be in a real state of zen or it's a spa day. <laughs> yeah. It's great to build all that stuff in if you can, but sometimes you need something in that moment just to yeah. come back to the here and now. Yeah. And those things will be different for everybody, right? I really love that. And it's an old wives tale, isn't it? Just take a few deep breaths. But there's something really powerful about, you know, three deep breaths will actually help you press pause on some of that crazy. For me, doing things like having a bit of a sing song, dancing around my office, going for a walk, because something that kind of physically shakes it out is usually a good thing for me. So there's something about using my body and kind of reminding my body that everything's safe because you don't, I always think you don't sing and dance if you're really unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. True. Good point. Really, you just really don't like you don't dance when you're moody. You just don't. Yeah. But when you're in that kind of my green zone, would be dancing around the kitchen, singing along to something on Spotify, having a good time. And if I think okay, I can force my body to do that, and it reminds my brain that everything's okay because when we're dancing, we're happy. Yeah, or at least you're safe in the now. You know, yeah, that's important as well. And then you can tackle what you need to tackle. So yeah, even little things like I think taking a breath is really, really useful. Um, there's loads of different breathing techniques. Square breathing is really great where you breathe in, you hold, you breathe out and you hold. Yeah. You have to think about the way that you breathe. One that I love is colour spotting. So you can mm. do this anywhere. You can just pick any colour you like, look around the space that you're in and notice everything that has that colour in it. And what you'll start to do is notice the big things and hone in on really small details. Um, and that just brings you back to this current moment. So it's a mindfulness-based technique. Because often what happens when we're worrying or when we're stressed is we're either worrying about the past or we're worrying about the things that might happen or could happen and we're not really present in this moment um so you can use something like color spotting or even the five senses exercise where you come back to each of your senses just to orientate yourself back into your space love it I, while you were saying it I haven't heard that color spotting one before I've just done it in my office and I've gone yellow massive post-it note yellow flower yellow card on the notice board yellow fan yellow battle for flamingo and yellow on my book and that's like yeah. I've gone, oh brilliant you probably oh. discover something new going oh I didn't know there's yellow there um <laughs> I've like, totally forgotten that, that exactly, card was up there. Yeah. Like, oh, that was a card from a friend how lovely is that and like, it's kind of like yeah really in- that's brilliant I love that and that Absolutely. you can even do in a meeting or if you're talking to someone and it wouldn't be too intrusive or rude but you know sometimes you need things up your sleeve that you know that you're doing and no one else does so it doesn't feel yeah. like closing but even it might be just um, having a cup of tea or coffee but really slowing yeah. down that process or mindfully eating so there'll be things that you can incorporate into your day as moments and then you can focus on some of the bigger self-care stuff as you need it like going yeah. to the gym if that's your thing or going for a walk or uh, I don't know taking a class or going for a massage book those things in but also top up in the day if you need it as well mm, you're so right about the we often think and it's the same actually with joy when we're doing the research for the book mm. looking at this idea that we often think these things are big things and they take loads and loads of time yeah and therefore we don't do them but there are so many things you can do in that instant I literally did it while you were talking to me so yeah. it's like two sentences worth and I did it and I was like that's amazing I love it mm-hmm. so there are so many things that we can do that bring that sense and almost if we I wonder if we could practice them when we're in the green zone so that we remember what they are. And then if we're feeling going into the orange or feeling the kind of red building, it's like, okay, I've got all these things. Which one am I going to try? And maybe I try four of them because it's a big thing or maybe one of them works but you've got yeah. something there that can really help you that's one of the major tips that I give the clients that I work with is because what you're doing is you're you're anchoring your day so I, I would say to people do one in the morning do one in the evening and just sprinkle it in if you need to because yeah. there's, there's a number of reasons for it one is you kind of solidify um using it when you're not feeling stressed then what Mm. happens is if you are feeling stressed your logic remembers that there's other ways to deal with stress and actually the more you practice you can actually start to change your 
brain pathways over time. So if you are someone who's maybe experienced a lot of anxiety or experienced stress, um, it's sometimes really strange that we get used to living within that state. So when mm. people start to feel more relaxed, it feels very strange to them. Like, why am I so relaxed? Or why am I coping with things a bit better? Like nothing's actually externally changed, but my response is changing. And so you can actually change the structure of your brain even as an adult. So the more you practice, the more it becomes a part of your neural pathways. So that's why there's, yeah, there's a number of reasons why it's useful just to get familiar with a couple of the techniques. When you're not in the state of needing it, it's a a proactive thing. I love that. I was just giggling to myself while you were talking about that because that whole kind of, it can feel a bit weird when you go into that zone. I have been for the last year or so really trying hard and it does not come naturally to me to value and prioritize and rest yeah like rest is a it doesn't really fit with my brain and how I do things and but I know I need to do it so I've been working on it and the other day I will tell you this little story I was sat on the sofa with my husband and I went I'm resting and he went yes you are and he, I said to him you have you haven't said anything about this and he said I hoped you wouldn't notice mm. and I was like I don't know how I feel about it and he goes I know you don't but yeah. this is really good this is progress like not knowing how you feel about it is okay yeah the fact you're doing it is a good thing yeah definitely and it can be challenging because I think um you know I can sometimes experience that as well when you're super busy and you just keep going and keep going and keep going there can be lots of emotions then that get pushed to the side or lots of thoughts that get pushed to the side and I think initially it feels a bit scary because when you're resting it allows space for some of those thoughts and feelings to come in um, yeah. so that's where you know your grounding your your coping your self-care comes in as well um and even if you start by a little pocket so like 10 minutes rest or 15 um or even if it's you know something else that feels relaxing that's that's super important i think sometimes that's why you see that when people are busy in the day they're distracted but when it comes to nighttime they can't sleep um and their yes. thoughts start racing it's because there's been distraction the whole day and and now the space is there for the thoughts and feelings to come in yeah and it's like oh I don't really want to have to deal with them right now thank you yeah can I just do something else (laughs) avoid avoid (laughs) avoid avoid button press please please (laughs) let me avoid it um and I, I it's so interesting with all these things is that we all know this stuff is important right there's no lack of knowledge around well-being being important around making sure that you give yourself time and space around the fact that you know our brains are complex little things that make us um a bit challenged in certain ways yeah but actually building the helpful habits into your day is a process that can be quite challenging in itself like finding the space to do that knowing that you've done it there's always I think as well when you then have a day where you haven't maybe done one of those sprinklings of you know thinking about things in the right way of doing those little exercises yeah that can bring up a lot of things like the failure things like, oh I'm rubbish at this yeah. I knew it would never work and then we end up bound down back in that negativity cycle of kind of self-destruction and self uh, I don't have yeah. a proper word for it I like that word to <laughs> 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 spiral down into yeah that self-criticism right that kind yeah. of amps up that voice but this isn't about perfection this is about see it as learning a new skill So when you first learn to drive, for example, you have to learn how different bits of the car work. And sometimes you're going to stall um, if it's an automatic car. Uh, And then, you know, you kind of by some, you know, at some point it becomes automatic and it just becomes something that you do. So what I say to people is don't aim for perfection, but just tag it onto something you normally do. So do a bit of color spotting when you're brushing your teeth. Um, you know, at some point, the more consistent you are, the more it just becomes a part of your routine. Yeah. Um, and you'll start to then notice, like you said, the difference in how you feel, which will then, you know, hopefully up the motivation to continue with it. Um, because if you notice a change in your feeling, if you're feeling more relaxed, if you're feeling calmer, if there's kind of a ripple effect on that in terms of how you're coping, you probably at some point might need to do it more because what will happen is you'll start to notice when you're more stressed rather than more relaxed because relaxation yeah. will become your natural default. But it is it is a bit of hard work, um, but you can just start small tag it onto things that you already do don't try and run before you can walk and just make little subtle changes it's like um kind of gym for your mind 
you know you're not yeah. going to go in and suddenly run a marathon if you've never trained so you're kind <laughs> yeah. of you're retraining your brain it takes a little bit of time but you've also got to think about your own why like why is it important for you to do that you know even though it takes a little bit of effort probably because you're going to be thinking feeling and doing things a lot differently yeah and you know working through that change process is always going to be a bit icky and sticky and habit stacking the stuff onto the things that you already do and deciding that it's important to you so you have that why and you know the reason why you're trying to do it all of those things can help as can I think allowing yourself a few days where you don't get it right yeah exactly so what is right and what is wrong you know I think that you know what's your version yeah exactly and often when we're self-critical you know if we bring in the compassionate voice would you talk to somebody else in that way and sometimes when we tune into what we actually say to ourselves or we say it out loud it's a little bit scary like we'd never probably talk to anybody else in that way but we just kind of take that critical voice as being factual so even if you kind of tune into it just just think about you know is this something I would say to someone else? And if it's probably not, then you probably want to reframe how you're talking to yourself as well. Yeah. And I, it's really interesting this point and I'm just going to, I haven't quite got the answer that I'm looking for. I'm going to blur around it is I think sometimes we bully ourselves Mm. because that's the kind of, you know, the kind of things we say to ourselves, I would absolutely not say to any of my friends or coworkers Mm. just wouldn't ever dream of being that harsh on people but mm. internally we can be quite self-destructive mm. yeah and I think there's probably a number of reasons for that um you know it might be linked to what we've seen and how we've seen other people respond to themselves so kind of growing up it might be based on our beliefs and values about ourselves so whether mm. we think we're worthy and deserving um or whether we have to work extra hard to be worth something so I'd check in on kind of worthiness and value like on an Mm. unconscious level Um, but also it might be in a in a kind of weird way uh one of the questions I ask is sort of what is that voice trying to do for you yeah sometimes it's protection sometimes it's motivation sometimes it's about helping you to achieve your full potential so there's a there's a purpose to that voice sometimes it's staying safe sometimes it's you know I'll be critical to myself so that I'm not sensitive to someone else's rejection or criticism yeah I want to figure out like what is the purpose of this voice and is there a way that I can get the same needs met but in a healthier way yeah really really fascinating that and kind of really understanding what it's trying to tell you Mm. like what's the what's the thing it's actually trying to get you to do or think about or make happen and kind of going a oh actually that's really helpful if I know that now I can do something about that or a actually you want to keep me safe but I want to grow so we're going to have to have a conversation about yeah. How, we, how we work together, my brain and myself. Yeah, and if you've got your inner critic, you probably want your inner cheerle- cheerleader as well. So yes. you know, that's the voice and you can work on developing. And that doesn't mean that voice is always going to say, like, don't worry about it, you're right all the time, because there's something important about accountability. Um, but you can take accountability and not be kind of self-deprecating and horrible to yourself. Absolutely. Um, right. Moving on a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about your book that you um, kind of teased us with at the beginning? Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so uh, the book is called The Magic in Me. Um, It's a 30-day self-empowerment book, and it's focused on relationships, but the relationship with ourself. Um, So I use a lot of my therapeutic tools that I'd use in therapy with people, and the goal of the book really is to encourage people to build in some of that self-reflection to start to get to know who they are to think about their internal world so things like their inner thoughts how they start to challenge that how they regulate themselves but then also think about your external relationships and I think we're constantly told who we should be um, how we should act what we should be doing in life and I think hopefully this book just creates a little bit of a pause moment for you to reflect on what it is that you really want and uh, your values and your goals so every day there's a different activity to do which will last about five to ten minutes so it's a little bit of a commitment 
Um, but if you're thinking about your self-development journey, mm. my starting point, um, and maybe that is a part of your self-care to invest those 10 or 15 minutes in yourself. And then there's also a journaling section every day if you want to use that, which will give you an insight into your emotions, your mood, and how you can develop healthier coping mechanisms. So it's really about the reconnection to yourself sounds great and I love the idea of like five to ten minutes a day for 30 days it is a bit of a commitment but it's also not a major you have to have five hours a day on this like yeah. 10 minutes a day for 30 days is totally achievable yeah and the book's divided into three segments so your inner world your outer world and your authentic self so you can also use a book more fluidly and just randomly dip into it but also I would ask people to reflect on you know if you can't give yourself 10 minutes a day what does that actually say about your value and your worth mm. and how you're kind of putting your needs um on the map or not yeah. um so even if you start with you know one activity a week and then kind of build in a few more um this is about kind of you know challenging some of those beliefs around what you can and can't do because you could probably sit on instagram or any other social media platforms for for 10 minutes quite easily scrolling Oh, for sure. Yeah. 10 minutes more than that, I yeah. reckon. And actually, I, I did the maths um, as part of a session I did on kind of how we can build learning into our day. So mm. the maths on 10 minutes a day over a year, if you only did it on your actual working day, so it doesn't count weekends or the kind of couple of days you don't work during the yeah. week, and it doesn't count the kind of four weeks holiday that you would have, etc. cetera. Um, over a year, if you did 10 minutes a day, it's um, almost... <laughs> It's between five and six working days in total per year. Wow. So it's massive. Yeah. But you would never go, I've got a whole week, I'm going to take a whole week off work just to do learning. <laughs> You're yeah. not going to do that. But 10 minutes a day can achieve that for you over a year. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a kind of tangible amazing. way to do that. And I think it's more than just time. It's kind of the value that it gives to you. So mm. if you are in alignment with who you are, if you're kind of living authentically, if you're calmer, if you're more relaxed, there's going to be benefits to your working environment, to your relationships, to, you know, how you see yourself, your capabilities. So that is, there's kind of much wider reaching, um, you know, value to spending that 10 minutes a day on yourself. Yeah. It's not just the thing you're doing, it's the bigger picture stuff mm -hmm. and how it influences everything that you think about and do and how you feel about yourself almost because you're suddenly giving yourself the value of paying attention. Definitely. And, you know, I know that um, one of the reasons I wanted to write it is to make some of the like psychological and um, therapeutic tools available because I know that you know, a lot of people might not enter therapy for a number of reasons, or they might be on a waiting list, um, or just the thought of leaning into your thoughts and emotions can feel quite scary. Mm. So this gives you the potential to do that in kind of a very bite-sized way to gain that confidence. But it can also work really well alongside therapy if you are engaged in that, or yeah. you know, you finish therapy and just want something to kind of continue with. That's also another way that you can use it. Yeah, great. Sounds amazing. I'm very much looking forward to reading it. Um, right, I'm going to move us on to some quick fire questions. Right. Are you ready? I am ready as I love you. <laughs> <laughs> First question is, for you personally, what is always guaranteed to bring you some work joy? So I love what I do in terms of, you know, working with, with people. But I think what helps me stay passionate is actually it might feel a bit boring, but boundaries and mm. balance, you know, um, that's something I've really had to work on. So I'm quite boundaried with sort of my time. I don't work on weekends because I need that personal time. Um, and so I think balance is one of the key things that keeps me in the flow of what I'm doing and keeps me mm. creative. Yeah. I love those two things. And actually, we often talk about boundaries, but thinking them as the thing that brings you joy, I think is a really good way of considering them. So often people are like, oh, I need to put some new boundaries. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Let's focus on what the boundaries give you in yeah. terms of that opportunity. Yeah. I'm like you. I For the last few years, I've been focused on not working on the weekend. And it's made such a difference to my brain space and to my level of being really in it when I'm on it. Yeah. And then being able to step away from it as well. Love it. Question two, what book are you currently reading? 
So I'm reading kind of a book which is probably a little bit out there, but it's called Think and Grow Rich. Um, oh, yeah. Not necessarily because I want to be really rich, but um, just in terms of like understanding kind of the brain. I like to think outside of psychology sometimes um, just to kind of get different people's perspective mm. on on the brain and how we make sense of the world. And I guess I'm also interested in kind of different philosophies like I don't know, the law of attraction, but does that then mirror kind of thought challenging? So, you know, sometimes I feel like we say similar things in lots of different ways, uh, but people yeah. will attune to the language that resonates with them. So it's not a psychology related book as such, but yeah, I like to just kind of be influenced and think about how other people think about life. Love it. Uh, question three, what is one piece of advice or guidance that somebody has given you in your lifetime? that you always find yourself coming back to? I think it is um, kind of all we have is this moment. Um, mm. so a lot of the time we can let fear drive us or we get stuck in the past or we get stuck in what could happen in the future. And I think just coming back to this present moment, I try and do that. If I find myself spiraling or I'm feeling overwhelmed, I try and consciously come back to like, what do I actually know in the now? What can yeah. I actually do in the now? Where am I being self-critical in the now? So, you know, I think we can make a lot of assumptions around life as well and, and how much time we do or don't have. Um, so I think there's something really important about remembering to not take things for granted. Yeah. That's great. It's also really lovely to hear. And I know this will sound funny, but I'm going to say it anyway. When you say things like when I'm spiraling or feeling overwhelmed, it's massively reassuring to me that even somebody who has all these tools and techniques and understands the brain and has spent many, many years working with people to do this, that you still actually have those human feelings. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important to be in touch with that. So there's no shame in kind of naming that. Actually, it's empowering because you can say, mm. okay, I understand what's going on here. Um, you know, and I will say this to clients, although I have expertise, the real expert on your life is yourself. Yeah. You know, I'm not here to come in and fix things for you. Let's think about coping rather than cure. Let's think about reflection rather than reaction. And I think we're all a work in progress and that's okay to acknowledge. Yeah. It's it yeah. It's great to hear that because the so often I think, especially if you look at things like social media, people look like they've got it all nailed. Like we've got this life thing nailed. It's like actually the reality behind the scenes. It's so nice to have that. Do you know what you are there? And I love this idea as a therapist that you're there to help people do the stuff that they want to do. But it's up to them, and they're the one who knows themselves well enough. And you're just helping them to kind of see through the dirty window and kind of work out what's really going on for them and yeah and that's such a lovely way of thinking about it right question four mm. um what is one super practical easy to do thing that you think people could go and do today tomorrow the next day that would help them get a bit more joy in their working lives yeah, so I think, you know, what we spoke about in terms of habit stacking, so something grounding mm. at the beginning and the end of the day, I think that's really useful in terms of um, shifting your life philosophy. But also for me, I, I mean, I'm happy to share like my my personal routine, I start my day with kind of gratitude because I think where the tendency is to kind of look at the red flags, um, I have a morning routine where I wake up and I start to focus on some of the green flags. So what yeah. are the three things that I'm grateful for? Um, and sometimes that's internal, sometimes it's external. And on the hard days, that's a little bit harder, but it's still really important to try and find at least one green flag. Um, and so I actually tend to do that at the beginning and the end of the day I build in just about five minutes of reflective time and that really helped yeah. me just to feel a bit more settled I love that and I, those hard days and I, I the power of gratitude is well known like there's so much research on how it makes you happier having mm. it so I'm like totally makes sense to me it's just that little moment in time isn't it I had somebody on I think the season two of the podcast and I really like what he said here which is on those hard days when you're going oh I can't think of anything that I'm grateful for he says to try and I really like this what is it you could be grateful for oh, so yeah. don't put the pressure on what are you grateful for but what could you be and just to kind of allow yourself on those bad days to go a little bit further and kind of go oh actually I could be grateful for that maybe yeah. I don't feel it but maybe I could be yeah I love that that's really that's a really good thing and I think it just helps with that balancing of the brain as well yeah. um and even if it's been a challenging day you can even reflect on sort of what are the strengths that you brought to that scenario 
yeah. um, or how did you manage? Um, and that might also help you with the plan. I had somebody the other day and I'd, I'd had a bit of a, a week of not work-wise, but life-wise, you know, when like life admin just kind of gets up on you and there's so many different things you've got to do and appointments you've got to go to and things going wrong and having like work people at my house for the broadband and something else that got, it was just like a week of it. Yeah. And somebody said, what are you grateful for this week? And I said, I'm grateful I survived it. <laughs> Mm, yeah and it's like, sometimes it's just as like I got through that week I have the resilience I did not cry I did not have a breakdown I did not shout at anybody I made it through the week yeah that's enough for me and then you can always turn that into an I am statement so if you made it through yeah. the week what does that mean so it means that you I am resilient or it means that you know I'm balanced or I'm empowered and those are really important kind of I am statements for your brain to hear yeah, I love that. Oh, I might try that next time I'm doing gratitude stuff. Yeah. Think about what that means I am. Yeah. Yeah. Great tip there. Love it. And then finally, where can people find out more about you and your work? Sure. So you can have a look at my website, which is Um, So there's lots on there about the work that I offer, things that I do. There's also a link to the book on there as well, if you're trying to buy that. Um, and then you can also have a look at kind of my social media platforms. So probably the main one that I use is um, Instagram. So it's at Um so I share lots of like practical tools, techniques, tips, my thoughts, uh, media articles, etc. So those are the best places to find me. Excellent. And we'll pop those into the show notes so that people can click on straight through and find out more about you. Yeah. It's been fantastic talking to you today, Rena. Thank you so much for being our guest. Oh, my pleasure. It's been really fun. Well, a huge thank you again to Dr. Rena Bajaj for joining me today on the WorkJoy Jam podcast. There are so many great things and really practical tips that I'm taking away here. And I'm definitely going to go and do her 30 day uh, book challenge, looking at some of the things that we can do in five or 10 minutes a day to help our mind, the inner, the outer kind of real authentic us kind of version of things. So I'm excited to go and do that. Some of the things that really landed with me here is how do we understand what we're telling ourselves? How do we move from that survival zone into thriving what are we doing when we're trying to understand more about our emotions what's driving those is it fear is it other people's opinions is it expectations and actually this stat which I did not know before 70 to 100,000 thoughts per day that's a lot of stuff going on in our minds to filter to understand to be able to work through I love her idea of thinking about zooming out of the conversation we're having in our own minds and really checking in and considering are those things true or is it actually there are some things being blown out of proportion to understand that red amber green in your mind so many little great things there the one that I really loved was the color spotting and I've just done it again now and I'm spotting pink things next which is lots of flamingos because I've got a bit of a thing for flamingos going on in my office so great advice around habit stacking starting and ending your day building the coping mechanisms building the habits that create those neural pathways that when you then need them when you are in kind of that red flag moment you've got something ready built in and hopefully not so many um, red flag moments anyway because you've been working on those things so thank you again Dr Rena for coming on the Work Joy Jam podcast as you listeners know this is season seven and we have loads of episodes now I think nearly a hundred episodes lots of different people different backgrounds um, different experiences different advice um, to be able to go and listen to I like to think of all of our episodes as a bit of a pick and mix go and pick the things that appeal to you the people that are interesting to you and see where they go from there and if you're looking at how do you get more work joy in your life always remember we have our freebies available on the website createworkjoy.com there's one that's called work joy where do you get yours which is tracking and understanding where you get it and doing some reflection on that and the other one is if you're feeling a bit meh about your work at the moment is one called how to fall back in love with your job do go and download those totally free and see where it leads you have a great rest of your day